<clears throat> All right, so we are in week 11 now, and this week's topic is feminism. So uh, the argument that uh, we cover in the lecture today, um, you'll notice when you read the article for it that the, <clears throat> the argument itself is very long and the premises are very long. Um, so we're not going to go over it in the same way that we've gone over the other arguments simply because that would just be a lot of me reading directly off the screen. I don't think that's terribly helpful. Instead, I'm going to just sort of present um, the issues that are covered in the various uh, premises and sort of explain what those premises are, are getting at and uh, we'll approach the argument that way. Uh, the reason why the premises are uh, so long in this argument is because they're referring to a lot of actual um, information about the world rather than these sort of more schematic logical claims that we've been discussing before because this is much more of an applied topic, an applied subject than most of the others we've looked at. Uh, and that will be clear as we go through it. Uh, we're not going to hop right into the argument. Um, so the, the front, the first part of the presentation here will have a lot of information that is not in either of the uh, articles that you'll read from the textbook. Uh, so you want to make sure to pay close attention to this and remember that uh, for the quiz and for later on the final exam that the information on feminism, a lot of it is presented only in the lecture slides. So there is extra reason to watch the lecture recording thoroughly. Uh, not that there wasn't reason before, you should obviously be watching them, but uh, you want to pay close attention. With that being said, let's get started. <clears throat> so, um, feminism, when, when someone talks about, if someone just described themselves as a feminist, that doesn't really tell you, it tells you a very general feature about uh, their beliefs, their politics, their um, the ways that they feel like it's appropriate to act, <clears throat> uh, but it doesn't tell you specific things. So there are many different strands of feminism. Uh, different feminists, like different ethicists, will have wildly disagreeing views on certain things. Um, and so very generally, if we wanted to discuss what uh, is in common between pretty much all versions of feminism, uh, we would say that it has a practical goal, which is namely the elimination of gender-based oppression. So that's a practical goal. And then, of course, there are various theoretical differences uh, amongst different strands of feminist thinking, which will uh, analyze the notion of gender, the notion of oppression, uh, analyze those differently and of course on the basis of what theory of gender or what theory of oppression a particular feminist has that will of course determine what the appropriate methods for countering and eliminating that type of oppression is. <clears throat> so and as I say here it may be that feminism is more than that it's more than just the elimination of gender-based oppression to some feminists um, so they'll, they'll disagree on that. They'll disagree, as I've already mentioned, on what the appropriate um, methods to eliminate oppression are, and they will uh, differ about the nature of oppression and gender. <clears throat> now, as a sort of movement, um, as, a, as a type of philosophy, a type of theorizing, uh, feminism has been around for probably about... 300 years, something around that. Now, obviously, there were people who discussed um, the role of women vis and, and in society and their, their respective position with respect to uh, men in various societies. So this has been a continuous topic uh, from, from, through most cultures, through, through all of history. Um, but feminism as a sort of position um, uh, gets its start in the late 1700s with the agitation for political rights in particular. <clears throat> so uh, when we're talking about the history of feminism, um, 
as this particular movement, it's generally divided into three historical waves, uh, the first, the second, and the third. And you see the dates there uh, kind of give you an idea of those, um, the length of time that these so-called waves occupied. Now, when we say that they're waves, this isn't to indicate that each wave is totally uh, distinct and discontinuous from the previous one. There, it's not to say that the goal, as we'll see, it's not to say that the goal of one wave was completed and then the next wave had a new goal and didn't think about the old goal at all. That's it's it's cumulative. Uh, it's progressive in the sense of uh, continuing forward in the same general vein. <clears throat> So let's look at these different waves. So in addition to uh, being differentiated in terms of time period, they're also differentiated by the sort of primary practical goal. And as I mentioned, the first wave concerned primarily with political equality. Uh, and so when you think about women's suffrage movements, the beginning of the 20th century, the end of the 18th century, um, it's when there were many suffrage movements in, in all parts of the world. Um, or at least all parts of the Western world, um, <clears throat> that's sort of uh, the first wave of feminism. Um, and so suffrage is only one part of it, suffrage being the ability to vote. Um, in addition to that, there is also the ability to run for office and the ability to have sort of uh, specific uh, public political assemblies for the purpose of advocating for raising awareness of um, particularly women's issues. Uh, now, what's the motivation behind this? Well, the idea is that women were not properly, appropriately represented in the political sphere, um, in part because they couldn't hold office, and in part because they couldn't vote. Now, it's not sort of by, by definition true that someone is not represented, well, there is a certain sense, certain sense in which one is not represented if one hasn't been able to cast a vote in a sort of representative democracy. So uh, it's not by definite, it's not true by definition that women's interests cannot be can only be represented by women. Um, but it of course is much more likely that someone who has the experience of a woman will be able to represent women's interests. Um, so that's a very simple view of why it's sort of important, very generally speaking, for women to be able to vote and hold office, because it was simply, uh, as a matter of fact, not the case that their interests were being um, represented. And very generally, even if it had been the case that they were represented, this would have been sort of, as a matter of luck, it would have been very unlikely that this would continue. So... Uh, Women wanted to be able to directly advocate for their own interests by way of voting, uh, by way of participating as a representative in uh, representative democratic institutions, so on and so forth. <clears throat> um, so there are other things that we might talk about in terms of political equality, but those are sort of the big three. Running, being able to hold political office, run for political office, so women had held political office before this, but they had not been elected to do so for the most part. Uh, they had uh, filled in uh, after the death of somebody else, uh, if I remember my history correctly, at least in the United States. Um, now, so we'll go back and we look at the timelines here. So this is the 1700s to early 1900s. And we note that the second wave starts in the mid 1900s. So there's a sort of conspicuous gap between sort of the, the, the late 19-teens and the early 1940s, uh, the sort of late 1940s, or 1950s. Well, why is that? Well, we've got, got a bunch of war in there. And during that time, uh, for the most part, as a sort of social movement with a lot of momentum that was paid a lot of attention to, uh, feminism kind of comes to a halt because everyone is focused on uh, war efforts. Now, of course, just as feminism didn't, uh, or thoughts about women's issues and advocating and, and understanding women's place in society didn't start in the 1700s, 
Uh, it didn't stop during this period of time either, but it's again a sort of organized movement sort of thing. This is the way it's generally understood. <clears throat> so then the second way concerned primarily with social equality. Now again, as I said, this is not to say that the goals of the first wave had been totally realized, right? So sure, women, generally speaking, had the right to vote at the federal level and in most levels, uh, most state levels as well in the United States by the mid 1900s. Uh, but as we'll as we'll see when we talk about the third wave, not all women had the right to vote, um, either officially or pract or 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 for practical purposes. Um, and it still was and is the case that the representation of women in actual uh, governing bodies in this country is sort of uh, lower than you might expect given their uh, prevalence in the population. Um, and so when you see on, on Facebook or something pictures of, you know, these pictures may not, may not be entirely accurate, a room full of people making a decision about, say, um, women's rights to certain abortion procedures or other types of health care. Uh, you know, you're familiar with these pictures of it's a room full of old white dudes, right? Uh, so this phenomenon persists despite the fact that there is nothing legally barring women from holding office. Uh, you know, women openly run for various types of um, office. We've had, you know, women run for president. Uh, but their success at actually holding those, or actually gaining those offices is still not um, as much as you might expect it to be in a perfectly balanced, uh, equal society. So uh, that's just a long way of saying that political equality is not, is obviously not yet reached, or at least not obviously yet reached. And so it's still a continuing issue, and that carries on at the second wave, but the primary focus shifts to social equality. And so here uh, we're talking about things like, as I say on the slides, access to education, access to employment, compensation for employment, uh, equal social responsibility and respect. So what do we mean here? With equal access to education, we mean sort of there being places at um, institutions of higher education for women uh, and not just at women's only type uh, colleges. So you see a rise in co-ed education um, at large universities and at private universities um, you know, starting in the 50s and 60s and 70s. So for instance, Davidson College, uh, which is where my father went to undergrad, uh, when he was there in the early 70s, it was an all-male institution. Uh, it is not anymore, but e you can see that this, that this sort of thing, having uh, a lot of single-gender colleges, uh, was, was more prevalent even 40 years ago. There are still some of these. I don't know if there are any all-male colleges anymore, but there still are uh, all-female colleges colleges, uh, as far as I know. <clears throat> um, so that's access to education, equal access to employment. Um, so think about something like the show Mad Men, in which uh, more or less at the beginning, the women are in more clerical types of roles, like secretary, um, they are assistants, right? So it's not that women didn't or couldn't work, it's that the type of positions for which it was assumed they were qualified were sort of limited. And so uh, gaining uh, social equality means opening up the various types of positions, not just sort of clerical secretarial positions, but also, you know, managerial positions, uh, so on and so forth, um, to everybody, including women. Uh, that's another issue in so so social equality. And one, the issue that probably everyone's most familiar with uh, in the contemporary period is equal compensation for, for employment. So there's um, a lot of uh, discussion about the gender pay gap, discussing that uh, statistically it appears that women get paid less to do the exact same jobs than men. Uh, again, this is an issue with social equality. And finally, equal social responsibility and respect. Here we're talking about to what extent 
a person's roles, say, in a household, in a family, in society in general, are prescribed on the basis of their gender, right? So, again, when you think of the sort of typically 1950s TV show thing, you think of, you know, the man who goes off to work at wherever the hell he works, and then the woman at home, you know, wearing a frilly apron and, and cooking dinner and that kind of thing. Uh, that's the sort of, um, it's a caricature of the sort of situation of gender roles, uh, you know, at the time when second wave feminism is, is sort of uh, getting going. So trying to either uh, break up the kind of rigidity of those roles or at least uh, not denigrate household work as lesser somehow than non-household work. Uh, these are different ways of approaching the issue of social equality uh, for genders. So you can see there where we might have a disagreement between um, feminist scholars. Uh, you, can, you can either go for the idea that um, familial roles, that is roles in the household, roles in society, simply shouldn't be prescribed on the basis of gender. That would be one way to sort of break up this categorization. The other one would be to say, well, look, uh, it is appropriate, perhaps somehow natural, that the household versus non-household chores are divided up in a particular way according to gender. Uh, that's perfectly appropriate, some uh, feminist scholars have and might say. And just to say, but... Uh, the fact that they are broken up this way, we should realize that they are both equally important or complementary or something like that. So that's why I say responsibility uh, slash respect. And of course, that's obviously an issue that's still being dealt with um, in a sort of public and uh, significant way in our time. So when we say third wave fem feminism is the contemporary wave, we again don't mean to say that either social or political quality equality have been fully realized. <clears throat> in fact, it's obvious that they haven't been. So, um, what then is the difference in focus for third wave feminism? Well, the difference in focus here is that third wave feminism um, brings to bear this notion of intersectionality, right? So, this is the idea that feminism cannot take this idea of women's issues as a single monolithic thing, right? Uh, primarily, this, this third wave criticism of first and second wave feminism is saying that feminism of the first and second wave was essentially feminism for middle class white women, and saying that the interests of women, as they were put forward in most of this theorizing and action, uh, was, you know, again, the interests of middle class white women. And of course, um, the interests, the experience of women in, say, who aren't white, say, who aren't middle class, um, who aren't Protestant, right? So there's all kinds of different categories here that go into it. Uh, the experience of those women is going to be different. The challenges which they face are going to be different. And so theory should reflect the variety of these experiences as opposed to saying there is such a, this single unitary thing as women's issues. Now, that's not to say that there aren't some underlying currents going through um, the experience of women of all classes or women of all races, but that's sort of, you know, not enough to focus on just that, according to uh, things about intersectionality. So the third wave feminist says that the interests of, say, black women, the interests of poor women, uh, they were kind of put aside and even harmed uh, additionally by the first and second wave feminists' uh, focus on middle-class white women's issues. <clears throat> so that's, uh, that's the sort of historical uh, position of this idea of intersectionality. More generally, we can think of it simply as the modulation or combination of gender-based oppression with oppression based on other types of socially identifying characteristics, right? So I've already indicated that um, race, uh, religion, socioeconomic class, these are other social 
uh, features which will occasion uh, different types of oppression or privilege. So intersectionality is bringing us this idea that um, one can at the same time be both privileged and oppressed with respect to different other people uh, and with respect to sort of different parts of yourself, so to speak. So imagine uh, we have imagine some upper, some middle class white Protestant straight woman, right? Um, so she will be relatively disadvantaged um, in terms of the the expectations and and uh, things that she's ex the things that she's expected to do, the things that she's encouraged to do, so on and so forth. Uh, she will be relatively disadvantaged with respect to um, a middle class uh, Protestant white uh, straight man. However, she will be relatively advantaged with respect to uh, non-white people, so Hispanics, black people, simply because of being white. Now, it can of course obviously get complicated um, if, you know, we. it's not necessarily true that men in general are privileged with respect to all women. Uh, what do we get when we have these, these sort of weird interactions of sort of uh, white woman, black man of equal socioeconomic class? Who is relatively privileged with respect to whom? Well, there's not a single answer. It's going to depend on the context of the situation. So that's one of the primary, that's one of the primary lessons of a great deal of contemporary theory in general is that context is incredibly important and that very rarely can you get this single answer uh, to cover all of the sort of vagaries and, and intricacies of social interaction. Um, so there's a whole lot um, bound up in this concept of intersectionality uh, and it's sort of, you know, that's why it is so compelling for third wave theorists and why it gets so much discussion in contemporary uh, uh, discourse and literature. <clears throat> okay, so that's the sort of brief potted history of feminism, which is of course very simplified. And now we're going to look at the particular argument uh, entitled Liberal Feminism in Chapter 68 of the textbook. And so as I say, it's, it's written, the premises are very long and there are a lot of premises. And so to just sort of reproduce them on the slides of the presentation would not be incredibly helpful. So I'm not going to do it. Um, I'm going to give you an overview here and then I'm going to sort of go through and expra explain the premises in groups. So our... Uh, to, so the author of the article is Julina Oxley, and she is uh, taking, she's giving her own formulation of Susan Oaken's argument in into premise conclusion format. So as I understand it, Susan Oaken is giving an argument which is sort of written in a general narrative form, not in the sort of premise conclusion form that we have been used to seeing our arg uh, arguments presented in. And Julina Oxley is uh, condensing and formatting Susan Oaken's argument. And so the argument is meant to do the following. It is meant to explain the nature and sources of gender-based oppression, demonstrate the continued existence of gender-based oppression, and outline the remedies of gender-based oppression for gender-based oppression. So those are three sort of more or less discrete tasks uh, which the argument is attempting to do. And when you're evaluating the argument, you can evaluate it as to what extent it has succeeded in each one of these. Obviously, to be completely successful, it'd need to do all three. Um, Eve, but doing any one of them successfully is still an accomplishment. <clears throat> so first, the sources in nature. Um, so in premise one through conclusion six, we get this idea that um, there are expectations of gender which are reproduced and enforced basically everywhere in society. So um, at home, in terms of what types of things your parents buy you in terms of toys, what types of things they let you watch, who they let you play with, what types of things you wear, uh, what types of things they kind of encourage you to be interested in. Um, so from the beginning, 
this kind of uh, these kind of gender roles are impressed upon people, and they are reinforced absolutely everywhere. The idea is so that's what happens at home when you go to school. Uh, the same thing happens. Uh, you know, girls, you know, young girls will be wearing certain things in certain colors and talking about certain things. Uh, young boys wearing certain colors, certain types of clothes, talking about other things, doing particular things, so on and so forth. Um, and this continues uh, through all of your education and socialization into the workplace. In the workplace, you still get these sort of um, reinforcements of um, uh, expectations. And so the idea is that because these expectations of gender are reinforced at every level, reproduced at every level, um, we have this as it says, systemic cycle of oppression, right? So, uh, you know, more specifically, these pseudo-traditional roles of men and women in reproduction, child rearing, and home maintenance create a situation in which women are expected to prioritize unpaid work, that is, work in the household, work with raising the family, over paid work, namely professional work. These expected priorities diminish women's ability to advance professionally if they accept the priorities and punish disrespect women's professional advancement if they don't accept the priorities. So the second bullet point is meant to show that in a sense there's no way, of, no way out of it. Um, so if a woman accepts these pseudo-traditional roles, then she has diminished opportunity to advance professionally simply because you know, she's devoting time to doing other things. If she rejects the sort of uh, the, the traditional familiar role and attempts instead to advance her professional career, then she faces obstacles there uh, in the forms of you know, various types of being excluded, perhaps also uh, less compensation, um, um, being expected to do different types of work, additional work. You'll see a lot of discussion um, in popular and scholarly articles about the idea that wherever women work, they are expected in addition to doing this kind of, um, the, the, the professional, the job description work as it were, they're expected to do additional emotional work, somehow to be uh, emotionally supportive of particularly male colleagues, um, again, on top of doing their actual work. That sort of expectation is the sort of thing um, that, that's being talked about here. And so, of course, because that takes extra energy and time, um, it you know, prevents them from doing other things. So this is why it's, it's a cycle of oppression, because you know, regardless of whether a woman accepts these priorities or not, they are sort of, these priorities are pushed upon them in some way. Um, And the idea here is that, you know, these uh, expectations are pressed upon them simply because of um, their, their gender sex category. So because of being a woman, because of being a female human being, uh, these expectations are thrust upon them. It's like, you know, so imagine if, you know, so not imagine, you, you know, many people have probably experienced this. Uh, if you are uh, a young woman and someone asks you, oh, when are you going to you know, get married and have kids, right? The assumption that that's what you're going to do is part of this sort of pushing expectations on you. And if you were to say, oh, I don't think I'm interested in that sort of thing, you may get the response, you will be, right? As if, oh, it's inevitable, that's the way things go, all, you know, eventually all women want to do this, right? That's the kind of one of the enforcement mechanisms of these expectations. And it's again simply because you are a woman, a you know a female human being. Now, <clears throat> so the idea here is that these enforcement mechanisms, this way that things happen, uh, creates a uh, asymmetry of opportunities, right? And any situation in which there is an asymmetry of opportunities, um, on the sort of as it were, arbitrary basis, namely which, uh, which gender or sex you are, that is clearly unjust. And so, because these expectations are sort of arbitrarily uh, placed and enforced, and because this arbitrary um, 
enforcement and placement of expectations creates an asymmetry of opportunities, then these expectations are unjust, as are the social conditions underpinning them, right? So this is the first part of the argument, establishing that, uh, establishing how gender-based oppression works, according to Julina Oxley and Susan, Susan Oaken, uh, and why the why any situation in which uh, this sort of uh, phenomenon is occurring is an unjust one. So having established what gender-based oppression looks like and how it's bad, and then move on to talking to demonstrating that it exists. And I could say, I might say that it still exists. Uh, so this is particularly a liberal feminist argument because it's saying, uh, you know, look, things, it's not just that, you know, women used to be horribly oppressed and, you know, not allowed to do what they want and treat as property. To a certain extent, they still are. Uh, there is still not a uh, so when I say total equality, that's a little bit misleading. There is still not a, still has not yet been reached an acceptable level of equality. Uh, total equality may be a sort of imaginary, figmentary thing, uh, but we don't have to assume that that's what they're after. Just um, an acceptable level of equality where there are no arbitrary asymmetries in opportunity, right? That's sort of an acceptable level. Uh, it's kind of abstract but that's what is being uh, pursued here. So to demonstrate that this level has not been achieved, uh, that's the second part of the argument, and so the conditions previously described do not belong to a bygone era, but to continue to exist today. And this isn't isolated to a single part of the argument, so I talk about this source and nature as being in P1 through 6. Uh, this is sort of shot through the entire argument. Um, and we can, we can you know, see that this is a continuing issue uh, by remembering things that we've already talked about, namely uh, the continued uh, efforts to achieve pay parity among men and women holding uh, comparable jobs. Um, you know, the pay gap is still a, you know, a thing, at least it's arguably a thing. Uh, and so as long as something like that exists, uh, the gender, this, this phenomenon of gender-based oppression still exists. Um, you still see, I don't, I mean, I don't know how prevalent it is. I don't have any polls in front of me, but you still see uh, not isolated to just particular uh, types of social groups, not only to particular ultra-conservative groups, this idea that something like women's place is in the home or women are or are not suited to certain occupations. This is still the sort of thing that you see uh, floated around. And sort of um, uh, in a high profile way, anyone familiar with, you know, three or so months ago, the, the kerfuffle at Google, where one of the programmers uh, circulated some memo, which was putting forward this idea that women that men were inherently better suited to being programmers or something to that effect than were women, and that diversity initiatives within uh, IT programming types of um, uh, professions were sort of harmful and sort of these purely politically motivated things rather than motivated by any kind of uh, facts. Uh, that was that. Was, those were the contents of his his um, memo that he circulated. Um, so that, in and of itself, shows that there is still some kind of issue. Uh, these two things show that there's some kind of issue remaining about gender-based oppression. Um, and then, of course, uh, perhaps the most high-profile one, the one that we see, you know, constantly in the news, is this continued conflict over women's access to and coverage for various types of reproductive care. Um, so here I'm not just talking about uh, coverage for uh, abortive procedures. Um, we're talking about uh, maternity leave, uh, paid maternity leave, the, not just whether or not your profession, um, your job gives it to you, but how long it is. Um, whether, whether it's only after you give birth, whether there's some time allowed to you to be paid uh, 
you know, in this, the period of time directly before the birth, uh, whether or not, uh, you know, there's also leave for the other parent so that not all of the, all of the child care responsibility falls on the mother, um, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, reproductive care covers a tremendous uh, gamut of different things, not just, we're not just talking about abortion here. So um, it would be a sort of cynical and um, misleading move to focus only on abortion here because there are all kinds of other things that are relevant as well. And then finally, we consider whether or not there is any de facto division of unpaid work and family units. Again, how much of this so-called emotional labor falls asymmetrically on women? Uh, how much of the... It, Emotional work, are they expected to shoulder all on their own in the family unit? And then, of course, outside the family unit as well in their, in their professions. So the, the fact of these, um, when I say the fact of these, you know, you may have some kind of disagreement as to what extent any one of these is uh, a problem. But the fact that so many people feel that it is a problem is at least enough to merit serious consideration. Um, again, there's a little bit of, when people try to appeal only to sort of statistical facts in this sort of issue, there's a certain extent to which they miss the point, right? Um, and of course, there's a certain extent to which the statistical results couldn't help you one way or the other anyway. The fact that there is this feeling of being oppressed so prevalently felt is uh, enough to say that there is some kind of issue present even now. Um, because it would be very difficult to say that the, you know, all of the people who feel oppressed on the basis of their gender, that they're all systematically confused or wrong or in collusion as some sort of conspiracy. That would be a very bizarre thing to say. And it would be very difficult to demonstrate. So again, the mere widespread feeling of oppression is enough to sort of uh, warrant some kind of uh, at least intellectual consideration and also uh, uh, social political action as well. So um, then we move on from P10 to C11 with the sort of remedies suggested by uh, um, Julina Oxley and uh, Susan Oaken. And so the idea is, of course, to eliminate the underlying social facts and dynamics which perpetuate and create the um, unequal division of particularly unpaid labor. So the idea is that um, children are inculcated incredibly early with these dynamics, right? Incredibly early, so, you know, when, when you see people um, complaining about the difference in toys for young boys and young girls, um, you know, if all of the, if all of young girls' toys are about sort of, you know, they're dollhouses, they're about taking care of babies, they're about, you know, setting up a house, they're about homemaking, et cetera, et cetera, that's sort of saying, well, look, from the very beginning, this is being kind of foisted on them. And so that's the kind of thing that has to be gotten rid of. Um, so children are inculcated with the expectation of how paid and unpaid work is divided between parents, and they will carry those expectations with them as they eventually move into their own family and professional lives, both conforming to and enforcing those expectations. So if in your family, should you have one, uh, there is a certain division of labor between you and your partner with respect to child care and um, sort of housekeeping, housemaking, uh, it's very likely that you are replicating some version of what your parents did in terms of the division of labor. Now again, it doesn't do for you to say, oh, I don't do this, therefore this whole thing is wrong. Um, we're in a sort of more delicate evidential position than with a you know, straightforward logical arguments you've seen before, a single instance of something does not count as a counterexample in this situation. We are talking about trends, uh, 
So there's got to be a kind of critical mass of such examples, um, and it has to be some way systematically true before you could say, look, um, almost no one actually thinks of themselves to be replicating these, these pseudo-traditional um, divisions of unpaid labor. So the fact that the argument is telling us that these things still exist, well, it's suspicious, right? Um, so again, it's very difficult to adjudicate exactly when this argument would be wrong, exactly when it would be right. But um, there's a, a more general sense that enough people would say, yeah, I do this because this is the way I was done in my, when I grew up uh, to sort of carry through this point. So the point of all that is saying that the remedy, according to um, Oxley and Oaken, is to reformulate the family unit, right? It's not, it's not saying we need to establish, or it's not saying we should only establish laws and sort of top-down things. It has to be primarily bottom-up stuff. Um, so, of course, top-down measures will also need to be enacted, as I say, to facilitate these alterations and protect those who execute them, right? So, um, this goes back to what we said on slide five. Um, people who don't accept the traditional, pseudo-traditional uh, gender roles have to somehow be protected from uh, people who do accept them uh, so that they don't have uh, the, the consequences visited on them, right? So <clears throat> what I mean here is, say you have in a, in a particularly conservative environment where there's a high level of acceptance of the idea that you know women's work is in the house, so to speak. If in such a community, a woman uh, decides that she doesn't want to do housework, doesn't want to, you know, sort of have a family and all that. She wants to do professional work. She's very likely to face pushback, um, not just informal pushback, but she may actually be, um, you know, passed over for promotion, uh, not hired in the first place, so on and so forth. And the idea is that laws need to be acted to prevent that sort of thing from happening so that people are allowed to experiment with and express these different priorities because otherwise they're never going to take hold. So things need to be changed from the bottom up, but those bottom up changes need to be facilitated by top down um, uh, measures as well. So it's not an all, all bottom up or all top down thing, but uh, the argument is stressing a greater importance on bottom up stuff. So it has to start as it were at home. That's the idea. Um, so there might be some criticisms about this argument in general. So we're, we're, we're basically done with the argument. Um, what might people say against it? Even from within, within the feminist camp, if that's a thing, you might get some pushback at the form of the argument, right? So why? Well, because it takes for granted categories of man and woman, takes uh, elements like the nuclear family as sort of um, normatively important, right? It takes those sort of things for granted. Family is equated to a man and a woman with their children. So this is, this is in, the, in the jargon of uh, sort of critical gender theory, this is heteronormative, right? It's saying, oh, what's normal is uh, one man, one woman, married, having children. Um, so we might ask whether the effect that, um, that Oxley and Oaken want, whether that can be affected by, without clinging to this idea of uh, a heteronormative nuclear family. Um, if that's true, then, well, why not go a step further and also deal with other types of oppression? Um, and another idea would be that the very concept of these roles, or the very concept of the genders to which the roles are attached, guarantees that there is going to be inequality. So the only way to successfully eliminate the equality again, this is a criticism from a sort of third wave perspective, would be to abandon using these gender roles. 
don't allow them to be sort of enforced at all. Don't just redefine the gender roles, do away with them, right? That would be kind of the idea. So that's what I, that's what I mean when I say to eliminate the gender complex, get rid of this notion of gender as an socially important category. Now that'd be, that's a very sort of radical solution, but it's a solution that, that may be put forward. So I'm talking about these sort of categories of sex and gender, haven't really you sort of taken these at an intuitive level. These criticisms that I was mentioning from the third wave there indicate that there is substantial theoretical work to be done in simply talking about the notions of sex and gender. And so um, I'm going to cover very briefly one influential way of discussing sex and gender and the difference between them it is by no means the it's by no means an uncontroversial way. Um, I, 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 don't even, I don't have the sense to tell you whether or not it's, I mean, I don't have the sense, I mean, I don't have the proper information. Um, I don't have a proper grasp of the literature to tell you whether this is really prevalent, whether this is the dominant one uh, or anything like that. It is one way which is common. I'll, I'll say that much. So um, contemporary discussions often take part of their work as reconceptualizing sex and gender and the relationship between sex and gender. So one way we can do this is to talk about sex as being uh, defined in terms of differentiating biological characteristics. So when you say that someone is male, that means that they have, say, external genitalia, that is a penis, uh, that they have certain um, hormone balances, etc., etc. To say that someone is female is to say that they have internal reproductive organs, um, they have a uterus, so on and so forth, and that they have uh, certain hormone balances, certain other secondary sexual characteristics, so on and so forth. Um, so reproductive organs, sexual, secondary sexual characteristics, relative hormone levels are three, not the only three, things that uh, you might take to be definitive of sex, right? So also talk about chromosomes and, and, and so on and so forth. On the other hand, gender is taken to be distinguished by social or behavioral characteristics, which may or may not have anything to do with the biological characteristics. So we're talking about uh, social behavior characteristics. We're talking not just about sort of what kind of jobs they are allowed to do, what kinds of work they do and don't do in the family. We're talking about more fundamental things, more fundamental things like, um, you know, whether they are rational, predominantly rational, predominantly emotional, whether they are predominantly dominant, predominantly sub submissive, so on and so forth. The sort of um, stereotypical uh, Western way, you know, American way of talking about the differences between men and women is to say, oh, men are more rational, women are more emotional. Men are more dominant, women are more submissive. And this is taken by some to be natural, right? To be a direct consequence of uh, biological features in some way, right? So um, what we get in some of these uh, more contemporary theories is to reject binary characteristics, characterizations of sex, gender, or both, and reject substantial or morally relevant connections between these two sets of concepts. So there's a bunch to say here, but we're not going to get too far into it. Generally speaking, a binary distinction is when you have to be either all X or all Y, right? So think about forms that you have to fill out, you know, for applications. Uh, when you go to a doctor or whatever, it will ask you uh, male or female. I will say man or woman. So it's probably male or female. You have to check one box and only one box, generally speaking. Um, that's the expectation. <coughs> so that's what a binary characteristic is. Um, so if sex and gender are binary, then you have to be, as it were, all male or all female, all man or all woman, whatever that means, right? Um, a non-binary distinction, so there's a couple of there's a couple of different ways of talking about what a non-binary distinction is. So 
something could be non-binary by there being more than two options, right? So certain, uh, st <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> certain forms in the state of California now have male, female, and N for non-binary. So that would be a trinary distinction. You can still only pick one box, but now there are three of them. On the other hand, you could talk about spectrum, uh, or spectra, which is the plural of spectrum. You could say, well, you don't have to be all one or the other. There's kind of this, you know, there's infinitely many points between one side and the next. Um, and so you can be closer to one side or the other. Um, and this would apply to both sex and gender. So, of course, there are people who, um, you know, who may have both sets of genitalia, um, people who have unusual chromosome structures, people who have unusual hormone balances, uh, in which case they are uh, what's sometimes referred to as intersexed. Um, so that would be a reason to talk about a spectrum of sexual characteristics. And for gender, it's more obviously the case. Someone can be more manly or more womanly, uh, whatever that means. Um, and so you don't have to be all one or the other. So usually when people are rejecting binary distinctions, what they mean to be putting forward is this idea that these distinctions are on a spectrum. Not necessarily that you should just add another discrete option, right? So the real difference here is between discrete distinctions and continuous distinctions. When I say discrete, I don't mean like secret. Uh, when someone tells you to be discrete, they mean don't make a big fuss. I mean discrete in the sense of like math. Discrete as in it's well-defined, you know, like a box that you have to fit in. Um, what, what people want to generally a, a, um, agitate for when they say, oh, it's not a binary distinction, is they want to say, you don't have to fit neatly in just one box, right? Instead, there's this line. You can fall in any one of the infinite places on this line. In terms of substantial connections, so when people say that gender roles... Uh, gender uh, definitive behavior is a consequence of certain biological features, they are positing a substantial connection between sex and gender. When someone tells you something like, you know, be a real man or uh, stop, you know, start acting like a real woman, they're telling you, um, hey, look, you have this particular body shape, therefore, it is appropriate for you, it is required of you to act in particular ways. That's positing a morally relevant connection between sex and gender. So to reject those would be to say that there is no, there is no systematic connection between having a certain you know, hormone balance, body type, and any sort of behavior, right? Um, there is no... Um, moral imperative that you must act a particular way because you have a particular body type. That's what it would be to reject uh, these substantial or moral connections between sex and gender. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me, we could continue to sort of criticize uh, the, the argument that's been the centerpiece of this by saying that this naturalness of gender roles is merely a statistical uh, the idea of naturalness of gender roles doesn't make any sense. Um, the fact that something is the case doesn't demonstrate that it ought to be the case. The fact of predominance and persistence could be explained by the existence of oppression, and that given this, the manifest fact of the existence of some inequality means criticism has to be aimed at the ethical desirability of equality. right? And that's what we're going to look at next week. Um, so the article, so it's again back to one article this week for the group work, and this is on the bias paradox, um, which is the way that it's described in the, um, in the chapter is directly related to uh, feminism. Uh, the bias paradox doesn't have to be simply a feminist issue, but that's the way it's presented in the textbook, and that's why it's sort of been paired with the argument about liberal, liberal feminism that we've just gone over.